Africa were in 1820. And now 200 years later is 2020. And they, there were 17 Jews that arrived on the shores of South Africa. It was called Algoa Bay at the time, which is near Port Elizabeth. Port Elizabeth hadn't been established yet, but Grahamstown had been established. And Benjamin Norton was a famous individual uh, with his members of his family, uh, stepped foot on South Africa in 1820. And he started off very briefly in Grahamstown and then moved on to Cape Town, where he established the Cape Town Hebrew congregation in 1821. And the first Yom Kippur service was held in 1821 on the spot where the Mount Nelson Hotel is now in Cape Town. Um, there were other uh, people among the, the 17 Jews. There were the Mosenthal brothers, and they moved, they started off, and they went into business, Joseph and Adolf Mosenthal, and they started a whole network of stores, of trading stores, of uh, sheep farming, cattle farming, and they eventually had their own currency. They were such a, a large network of businesses that they established their own um, their own currency. Uh, the bulk of the Jews we know are Litvaks, uh, tracing their lineage to Lithuania and the surrounding area. From 1880 to 1929, 50,000 Jews sought a better life away from Eastern Europe. It's an anti-Semitism and oppression and poverty. And they came to the land of diamonds and of gold, the southern tip of Africa. And the early pioneers, some of you that know, were Sammy Marks, who arrived in 1860s. But the real big wave was in 1880, when, when over 50,000 Jews came to South Africa. And they transformed what was then South African Jewry, which was mainly uh, English speaking and German people, German uh, root, they had the roots in Germany. And David Sachs, who's a, a world-renowned historian, spoke about the difference that when the, the German Jews and the English Jews came to South Africa, they couldn't work out with the Litvaks. The German Jews and the English Jews considered themselves uh, a better, from a better background, and they were more, more uh, refined. And so they started two different shuls, two different communities. Um, well, there was the Litvaks and there was the Yekas. And in Otson, they established something called the English Shul, the English Shul. And um, each one had its own way of worshipping and their own places. However, interestingly enough, there was very strong communal leadership in South Africa at the time. And they were able to encourage people to worship and stick to their um, backgrounds and their cultures and their heritage, but yet when it came to being united as South African Jews, they, they were able to unite and become one force for the benefit of South African Jewry. And that's one of the benefits, those of you that have studied South African history or that are familiar with South African history, um, we are a very, very strong united community when it comes to um, problems uh, outside of our community, we stand together. We have very strong leadership, despite the community being very small today and diminishing in numbers. Nevertheless, the people uh, respected the importance of being a united force because you need to take into consideration that South African Jews at its peak reached uh, 100, 120,000 people um, compared to the 5 million Europeans and over 55 million locals. So it, it, it was, you know, they were very small. So they found and understood the importance of standing together. Now try and understand for a moment, Jews came from Eastern Europe, from Germany, and they came to Africa. So now, first of all, they were not used to, um, they were not used to the climate. They came, they spoke Yiddish, German, um, Lithuanian, whatever it was, they never spoke Afrikaans, very, very few of them spoke English. And yet they had to land and they had to survive. So what did they do is they, um, they decided to use a Yiddish kop. What was a Yiddish kop? Was to trade. 
So what did they do? They became something called a smos, a, a traveler, a rep. And they went to a large wholesaling wholesaler and they got uh, uh, various supplies, depends what, what they specialized in with a bit of money that they came with and they got a horse and a cart and off they went. Now, don't, don't forget, we're talking about 1880, 1890, 1900. These are people that came, as I said to you, they were not used to the climate. They're not used to seeing, please don't get upset. They'd never seen black people before. They couldn't understand the culture of the country, but they had one, one understanding that they had to make it and they had to survive. And so they got a horse and a cart. Some of them just had a horse or a donkey and they went from town to town and they traded their goods. And while they traded their goods, they were able to interact with the local Afrikaans communities who at the time were extremely religious, many of them. And many, many of the farmers had something called a smos kamer, which in Afrikaans means a room for the peddler. And in this room, which was kept just for the Jewish smos, the Jewish peddler, and in there, there was a bed and a pot to boil a bit of potatoes or a few eggs or something. And that's where the, the Jewish smos traveler lived and stayed when he was moving around. Now, there weren't the roads we have today. And in many cases, they were going through mountains and through farms, etc. And there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of Jewish graves, unmarked Jewish graves in South Africa today of smos that were either sleeping under their donkey in the middle of the night or under the, uh, the donkey cart, should I say, whatever it is. And they were attacked by a snake or a wild animal, etc. And, 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 the, and they died in the, in the closest town. All they knew that the person was Jewish. Maybe they had a talisman feeling with them. Maybe they had a yamulka. Maybe the day before they were in the town and they knew they were Jewish, but they didn't know anything more than that. And they buried them in the Jewish cemetery. So you need to understand the high challenges, the many challenges that they had to go through. But during this time, they were able to, first of all, interact with the wider community, the Afrikaans community. And as we know, the Jewish people, according to the Old Testament, are the chosen nation. And the Afrikaans people, according to the New Testament, are considered the chosen nation there. And so there was always wonderful cooperation and liaison between the Afrikaans community and the Jewish community. And in many cases, when it came time to build shuls, when the Jews came into the town and started to develop in numbers, establish themselves in numbers, the local church, church often used to be a big contributor to paying to building a, a shul in the town, because it was for their benefit as well that they would have a strong Jewish community there. It goes so far that in the town of Hrafrenet, I can't see everybody, so I'm not sure even if you wave your hands if you've been to Hrafrenet, but there is a, a monument outside the town of Hrafrenet, which has a, is a tribute to the Smos, to the Jewish peddlers. Because when they traveled from town to town, don't forget in those days, they didn't have emails and cell phones and fax machines, etc. So the Smos would go from town to town and he would tell stories and relate news from one town to the next about the local Jewish community in the town before. And, and this person was the only, in many cases, the only source of information from one town to the next of what was happening. And so in this town of Hrafrenet, which is the third oldest, the, the town which established, in which the third oldest Jewish community was established, erected a smos in honor, a monument in honor of the Jewish smos. And this was done in, 20, in 1980. And the importance to this day, unfortunately, historically at its peak, the country communities, which were all the towns outside of Johannesburg, Cape Town, Pretoria, Port Elizabeth, East London, the bigger centers, there were over 40,000 Jews in these towns. And today, unfortunately, there are about 1,300 individuals left. Um, but that's um, right across South Africa. And some of these people have been there all their lives. Some are born there, some are second, third generation. And the wonderful um, interaction they have with the local people in the town is, is phenomenal. But there are just a few things I want to tell you. And the rabbi, if you want to stop me at any time, you're most welcome to. 
but it came in 1950, 1949, Chief Rabbi Louis Rabinovitz, um, some of you may know him, he was very controversial and very outspoken, saw that the Jewish country communities were dwindling Didn't in numbers. Didn't he recently pass away? Sorry? Didn't he recently pass away, last week or recently? No, no, that was somebody else. Oh. Yeah. And he decided that it was important that there should be something called a traveling rabbi, a country communities rabbi. And it should be somebody that is able to travel around the country visiting the people. Now in 1949, 1950, 1960, there were many, many large communities. And the rabbi at the time used to travel for two, three weeks at a time and spend a few days in each town and run cheder classes and do shchita, et cetera. Today with modern technology and Zoom and, and uh, Courier companies, you can send kosher meat from the bigger centers. And what we really need today, besides the regular visits, is funerals, weddings, uh, bar mitzvahs, etc., that needs to be on site. The rest can all be done and sent through. But he found it important, and, and therefore this organization was established through the Jewish Board of Deputies. And for 70 years, it was administered by the Jewish Board of Deputies. And I'm the seventh rabbi to hold this position. Uh, I was employed in 1993, and in the end of, 90, end of 2019, the Board of Deputies felt that it was time to close the department down because there were so few people and they had more important or their focus moved more to anti fighting anti-Semitism in South Africa. And so this Small Jewish Communities Association was established in Johannesburg, of which I'm the, as you heard, the national director and spiritual leader and basically, we get called out for anything from uh, a bris. Uh, I don't do the bris, but I take a moil with me to a bar mitzvah, to a wedding, God forbid, a funeral, an unveiling, uh, and everything in between. If somebody has a 50th birthday or a 60th wedding anniversary, so they want their rabbi there, and, and, and we're very much involved. So they're, they're, what, what's very important is that while we are a uh, strictly Jewish organization is we do administer to people that are married out of the faith. If one of the spouses, one of the partners are not Jewish, we don't ostracize them, but we just let them understand very clearly where, where, where they stand and where everybody stands. And from our experience, if you explain to people respectfully um, the limitations, etc., and where you're coming from, they, they, they in many cases, and I'll just tell you just out of interest, in, uh, in Harare, for example, in one or two small communities in Johannesburg, we have a situation where most of the men, not so, Harare, not so much as most of the men, but in, in, in South Africa, many of the communities, most of the men are married to non-Jewish ladies. And so the mentality, the thinking is that, uh, well, you know, just forget about them. They're, he's, you know, they're, they're lost cause. But when I started in 1993, I met with us couples and I explained to the non-Jewish spouse, whoever it was, the husband or the wife, the facts without dressing it up nicely, that today, when I visit a town, in most cases, the non-Jewish wives send their husbands to the shul or to the hotel where I'm staying to make the minion uh, because they see the importance of maintaining Judaism in the small towns as well as maintaining their own Judaism. So the, the, the secret, and I don't have the secret, but what I've tried and it's been pretty successful is if you explain to the non-Jewish person where they stand and how it works, et cetera, then there's, in many cases, they are not, uh, um, not negative and they don't discourage their Jewish partner, but in fact, they, they encourage their partner. Now, just a few things, just a few thoughts, and then I'll tell you a few stories that I've dealt with through anything. Uh, issues I've inter, uh, interacted with and encountered. So first of all, what is very important is that we Jews don't live in the past. We live through our past. And Rabbi Akiba will agree with me. Jews don't live in the past. We live through our past. If we don't acknowledge our past, the efforts of our ancestors, our history, I'm not only talking about the Torah, Rabbi, and all that, but I'm just talking about uh, what, what our ancestors did in each of these small towns, if we don't acknowledge them, then we don't have a future because A, um, we, it's, it's uh, disrespectful for them, but more importantly, the local Afrikaans people don't respect you either any longer. So it's very important to remember that, that Jews don't live in the past, we live through our past. And also, 
And as Jews, we don't predict the future, we create the future. Because just like Hanukkah, and just like throughout our history, the Spanish Inquisition, the Shoah, etc., the world want to destroy us. It's a simple thing, and, and, and there'll be something else next. Who knows what will happen in the next couple of years? Nobody knows. So the fact is that we can't predict the future. We actually have to, with our own two hands, create our own future. And I salute you, Rabbi, for what you're doing in living in uh, Liverpool. My son and I, besides, just to let you know, he's online as well. He are great Liverpool football supporters. So you're uh, you're our Rabbi. You're our you're our, our uh, chaplain for the Liverpool. He spent the Shabbos here a few years ago, and his host is here on the Zoom as well. Oh, amazing. Okay, great. Okay. Um, the work we do is split into three areas. Uh, it's looking after isolated Jewish people and communities um, to develop them and, the, and growth of the community's individuals. In many towns, there's only one Jew left. In some towns, there's only a Jewish cemetery left. In other towns, there are a number of Jews or a community. So each area is very different. Uh, we look after over 220 Jewish cemeteries comprising of over 30,000 Jewish graves. And then the other important thing is that we're involved in collecting artifacts, Jewish history, um, because as I said, our history and what we contributed to the country and to the people is vital that it's recorded. I can't see everybody again, I'm sorry, but there's a town called Prince Alfred Hamlet, which is in the Western Cape. And there were very few Jews there. And there's a guy, chap by the name of Joss Kahn. I don't know, maybe, I think uh, the, the Jack Klaas and Rosalie are in here from, from, uh, from Oatshorn originally. I think I saw their names. They'll remember Joss Kahn. And he said that today, the average Gentile living in South Africa doesn't know what a Jew looks like. Now think about that for a minute. Uh, living uh, Liverpool and the UK, whatever it is, you know, there's so many different places, etc. But the average place in South Africa today, we're a diminishing community, a rapidly diminishing community in general. And the average person in these small towns doesn't know what a Jew is and never interacted with a Jew. And I remember a story that uh, I had to go to a town called Victoria West to undertake exhumation of two, two uh, deceased people that municipality rezoned the area and they wanted it to be a commercial area. And there was a young colored lady uh, from the health department and she was supervising and everything. And after I was finished uh, doing the exhumation, etc., she asked me, like, what am I wearing on my head? And I explained to her, I'm Jewish and I'm a rabbi. And she said to me in Afrikaans, she said, and for those, for Jack and whoever else understands a big Afrikaans, is, did you like a yurt? is this what a Jew looks like? She had never seen a Jew before. She was a deeply religious Christian lady and she had read about the Jews, etc., Israel, etc., but she had never seen a living Jew. So she I said, to her, she, you know, she said she's seen them on TV in Israel, etc., but she's never seen a living Jew. And she said, can I touch you? She was so honored. So Rabbi, I won't answer you what I replied to her, but uh, it was, for her, it was a, a huge event. She had never, and she was very excited, and, and, and we still have contact today, and she sends me questions from her, the New Testament, etc. It is so important that for us in diminishing communities that we maintain a positive interaction with a wider community. People look for any little thing to target, negatively target Jews. And unfortunately, my father may rest in peace, he passed away three months ago. He says, Jew, he used to say, Jews create, create anti-Semitism. Often Jewish behavior is what creates a reaction and I'm not saying that's 100% accurate, however, it does, has happened. And it is so important that we, as communal leaders and as, as religious leaders, that we make sure that we interact in the most positive way with everybody. And more importantly, if there's ever a challenge, is, is to explain to people why we react the way that we do and why we make the decisions the way we do. And if it's necessary to get a source from the Bible, from the Torah, et cetera, 
but it's very important to engage people at all times. Um, in a town called Da'ar, uh, there again, maybe Jack and Rosalie will remember the name town Da'ar, there was a Jewish man um, who had a very large furniture store. However, the one window of his store was painted white. And I said to him, can you explain to me, surely you want the, your display of your furniture to be visible to everybody from the streets. Uh, why do you paint up a window? Now, this is a man, he was in his 60s. He was married to a non-Jewish lady and his children were obviously not Jewish. He said to me, come Rabbi, I want to show you. And he took me outside the shop and he showed me across the road, the building, which was once the shul and is now a church. And he said, I had my bar mitzvah in that building and I cannot look at it that it is a church today. This is a man that only when I visited him did he put on tefillin, was married out of the faith, never kept Yom Kippur, never kept anything. Obviously his children weren't Jewish, his wife wasn't children, weren't Jewish, but he couldn't handle that the shul that was, he had his bar mitzvah in, which is now a church. So he compromised his whole business by painting the entire uh, window on the side. It shows huge sensitivity. And uh, I always say that it, it's not, and Rabbi, you'll agree with me on this one. It's not for us to judge people why they do certain things, because we don't understand. Uh, maybe they weren't educated. Maybe they're feeling a little bit uh, resentful to a situation, and therefore they, they, they do these kind of things. But we need to be sensitive and not judge them for when they do these kind of uh, actions. Because in my opinion, his action of painting that window was almost as good uh, figuratively as probably somebody who kept kosher or put on tefillin every day or something. It was so important to him business, but yet it was even more important where he had his bar mitzvah. And I'll tell you another story similar to this. In South Africa, there is a policy that if somebody's married out of the faith, they, they shouldn't be buried in among all the other Jews. They get buried on the side or in a separate section. So in a town called Mafeking, some people may know that town as well, uh, Mafeking, right? Um, there was a Mr. Leviton who was married to a colored lady. She wasn't, in those days, it was very unpopular in the old South Africa. And he passed away. And we called the municipality. We said, listen, he's passed away. I'm coming from Johannesburg. Please prepare a grave. And they knew already that somebody's married out has to prepare a grave on the side of the cemetery. And I arrived with a Hebrew Kaddisha to collect his body. And his wife, this colored lady, handed me a packet, an old plastic packet. I don't know what you call it where you are. And she said, take this with you. I said, what is it? She says, it's his talus and his tefillin. He put them on every single day of his life. So there and then, I personally made up the decision. I found the municipality. I said, listen, you, you dig a new grave in line with everybody else. Because most of the people in that town never put on talus and tefillin every day. Here's a man married to a colored lady, but yet he understood and he observed the sensitivity of talus and tefillin. So there again, it's so important in, in, for me and for my role not to judge people and the levels of their observance and why they do certain things. Um, what's important for us is to encourage people, and this is what we do. And in, uh, I wrote a book called um, The Traveling Rabbi, My African Tribe. It's on the poster in the top right corner. It was a bestseller for three years in South Africa. And I toured uh, Australia, we sold almost a thousand, and toured Israel and sold hundreds. It's very successful, very easy read. And in there, I tell a story of um, a couple in Southwest Africa, which is now Namibia, in Swakopmund. So, this couple here, the man was already in his, in his mid early 80s, and he, for 50 years, was the chairman of the Messianic Jewish Church. However, he came from a Frum family from Eastern Europe. They left before his bar mitzvah and he came to, to Namibia, to Southwest Africa, which was a very German country at the time, or still is. And unfortunately, he got involved with a church. And for 50 years, he was there 
grand president. And that was a challenge that I undertook. And I used to visit him and initially he was very hostile and he, why are you visiting me? Don't waste my time, don't waste your time. Eventually it, it, he turned 83 and I asked him to put on tefillin. He wouldn't put on tefillin, but he put on a yamulka. And every time that I visited him, he would be wearing a yamulka. And then one day I said to him, tell me what's gonna happen at the time when you, after 120, please God you, he says, no, we're going to, my wife and I, we're going to be cremated. This burial business, it's nonsense. And according to the New Testament, there's nothing wrong with it. Anyway, for months and months and months, I persuaded him and worked on him to change his will. And one day he called me up from Swakopmund. And he said, listen, if you come tomorrow from Johannesburg, and you, my wife, and I go to the cemetery and we cho choose two graves that suit us. We will change our wills to be buried in the Jewish cemetery. And so I flew up the next day and we went to the cemetery and we chose two, two graves, etc. And then we went to the lawyers and they changed their wills to be, to be uh, buried. And she, he asked that I officiate at his funeral one day when he passes. And she didn't write anything. The wife, she was quite religious from the other way. Anyway, a couple of weeks later, she passed away. And they asked if the local priest could officiate at her funeral and not me. So I arranged for the Hebra Kadisha from Vintuk to go through to do the full Tahara on her. Made sure that the coffin was sealed without any crosses or whatever. And we made sure and we mentioned to the priest that he should not mention Yoshka at all. And he, and he respected that. Six weeks later, the husband passed away. And his last words to his nurse was, were, call Rabbi Silva if he'll take care of me. So here again, what am I, what am I saying? It's not about me. It's about, it's about the philosophy and the, and the, and the policy of, of, of not judging people why they did things, but to look forward to let them understand what the correct way is and to try. Not always have, been, have we been successful, but in most cases, uh, cremation is a big thing, unfortunately, in South Africa, but we have been successful in overturning many, many of, of the wills um, in, 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 uh, in South Africa. There are many, many stories that I could, I could tell you, and I, and I mean, we could talk about Africa a little bit just now, but, but also besides the, the general visits of me on the road touring the country, the length and breadth of South Africa, we send out Pesach supplies, we send out Hanukkah kits, we do a calendar at Rosh Hashanah times. So every Jewish house has a calendar or two, one in the kitchen, one in the lounge. Once I even visit somebody, they had it hanging on the back door of the bathroom, but anyway. At least they've got no excuse. They know when there's a yard site, they know when there's a Shabbos, they know when there's a Yom Tev. Um, and it's so important. And for many, many of these people, we are the only Jewish connection and contact that they have in South Africa. Because a lot of them, in fact, I, I bravely can say most of them, their children have all emigrated. They've all left the country. They're all living all over the world. And... Um, some of them don't even have emails, never mind Zoom or, or uh, you know. So the only living real contact they have is through our offices. And it's very, very rewarding that um, we fulfill this role and that they have in return um, this facility and this availability should they ever. And, and I, I could speak to you for days about various calls that we get that are totally random however, are real for people. Um, and also we work very closely with uh, the wider community. Uh, the rabbi mentioned that I'm the representative for the heavenly world. It's an, a peace organization right around the world. And I'm the Jewish representative for Sub-Saharan Africa, the, it's called the, so the Jewish ambassador. It's, it's, today we had, a, we had a, um, a Zoom, end of your Zoom call and 12 religious leaders offered prayers for, uh, for the world for the end of 2020, et cetera. It's so important that we're able to, to sit around the same table as the other religious leaders for two reasons. First of all, for them, 
that they can ask us questions and they can't say, oh, well, you know, you can never reach the rabbi, he's always busy or he doesn't know the answer, etc. Yeah. But more importantly is that the people outside see that we are prepared and willing to sit around the table, share ideas, share teachings, as well as answer questions and, and, and just be available where necessary. Um, it makes uh, secular people, it makes Jewish people around the world feel very much connected and much more secure that their rabbis are also sitting on various forums. Um, we interact with uh, almost every head of state in the 10 African countries that we're responsible to. And there again, it's a way of getting the local community um, recognition from the head of state, as well as it gives the head of state an avenue, should they ever want comments about uh, Israel or about the uh, Jewish community, about the Bible or something, or ideas even of, of what should they do, what's a, what concepts are good to introduce for children, etc. And I'm trying to think there was once a situation where um, in Swaziland, the, head, the king of Swaziland, I officiated at a funeral. And for those of you that are not aware, the local, the local African people, they spend tens of thousands of rands on fancy coffins and big meals after the funerals, etc. When they can't afford shoes, they can't afford school fees, they, they, they're really destitute. But when it comes to a funeral, they... And there was a Jewish gentleman, Kalman Goldblatt, who passed away in Swaziland. And we officiated at his funeral and the king's brother, one of the princes was there. And he had a very simple, the Jewish coffin, as we all know, with a black cloth. And the front page of the, of the local papers the next day said, Goldblatt has pauper funeral. Because they couldn't understand that the richer, he was second wealthiest man. Sorry, I meant to say that. Goldblatt was the second wealthiest man to the royal family. The second largest property owner in Swaziland. And immediately I phoned uh, the royal family and I said, listen, and the newspaper, I said, listen, this is the facts, this I want to explain to you. And the next day they did an explanation. And the next, I think it was two or three months later when the king addressed the country, he said to them, he said, you know, I met with a rabbi, et cetera. And he says, Goldblatt died. And he said, it's enough spending, uh, wasting money on fancy coffins and big meals and all that afterwards. We need to prioritize if, if the richest, European white man uh, died and he was buried in a plain coffin. It's, it's, it teaches us all something. And it's these kind of things that are, that are so important. I met Robert Mugabe once and it was Yom HaShoah. And um, I explained to him at the meeting what it's about, et cetera. And in one of his talks, he was actually, he mentioned the importance of remembering uh, the Shoah and remembering what it's about and how, how the Jewish people didn't just lie down and, and, show, and close their eyes and never wake up, but they actually, came, you know, they came back and um, created the state of Israel, etc. So it's very important that um, there is great interaction with. Uh, I noticed, Rabbi, that you you had uh, you were lighting Hanukkah candles with the, the was it not the mayor, it was the attorney general. What was it? The Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, thank you. Okay, yeah. The mayor very, very important. is unable to attend this year. Okay. The legal yeah, very important. Um, I even had lunch a few times with the Queen of England. Uh, that's a difference. We upset her once. She insulted her so much. She just walked off. And I was worried, where are your manners, lady? Should I tell the story, Rabbi, or better not? Definitely tell. Definitely tell us. Okay, all right. So I was invited to an audience with the Queen and... and uh, before she came into the room, they give you a whole lesson for, I'm sure some of you have met the queen and majesty the queen, and they give you a whole lot of uh, things they tell you, you mustn't say this and you can say that, et cetera. So anyway, and at that stage, we were working on the Mauritian Jewish history, which goes back uh, very briefly because time is moving on. Uh, what happened was in 1939, a number of Jews left Eastern Europe and they arrived in British Palestine uh, the British then declared them illegals and wouldn't let them stay in, in British Palestine and wanted to send them back to Eastern Europe. Eastern Europe was too, the war was going crazy and the, the sea was really too dangerous. So Mauritius, which was also at that stage under the British 
mandate uh, had an empty prison and they sent the Jews there. And for four and a half years, nearly five years, the Jews were held in Mauritius. And after the war, they were sent off back to uh, British Palestine. And to me, I couldn't understand that, you know, we, in our davening and our praying, etc., we always, we believe and we want, we pray that we should be returned to our homeland and to the land of Israel, not only the state of Israel, the land of Israel. And here the British who were occupying deported these Jews. And it was thousands, it was over 3,000. I just couldn't understand it. At that time, it was the Queen's father, King George. So one of the things I tell you is you, never, you don't say you. You always have to use the title, your majesty or his royal, his royal highness. So anyway, to my, comes my time to talk to the queen and we're chatting and everything. And I was very passionate that, I mean, you know me, Rabbi, uh, <laughs> uh, difficult to hold back on certain things. And we were talking, I was telling her the story about Mauritius. And I said, under your father's leadership and rule, they weren't allowed in, to stay in British Palestine. And she just walked off. So I thought, hey, you know, like, I also got manners. Where are your manners, lady? The guy behind her came to me and he said, no, you broke protocol. You said your father instead of saying you're His Royal Highness King George. Um, a while later, I met her. I didn't mention it, but we, we had a good laugh about something else. But um, so, yeah, so I, I mean, it's all these kind of situations which are so important because for us, it's, you know, we, we can laugh at it, but in, in many cases, these, I remember once one of my early visits to the King of Swaziland, they were taking photographs and I walked behind him to get into my position. And you never walk behind royalty because symbolically somebody goes up behind them and can stab them in the back. From nowhere, security were coming. It was just hectic. Anyway, he just burst out laughing. He said to them, ah, what does the rabbi know? Leave him, it's fine, you know. <laughs> um, it's all these kind of things that are so important to building a connection and to building um, yeah, a connection with people of authority that win. And in fact, and, and I'm very proud of it to say that um, if you look for, your, for the people that are following um, at the news, et cetera, there is very little anti-Israel sentiment in the African media. And one of the main reasons for that is that we work continuously, regularly with government, Afri uh, besides South Africa, I can't talk about South Africa, but we talk, we deal regularly to explain to them that it's not, first of all, most of the negative uh, publicity against Israel is, is not true, inaccurate, and say, well, it doesn't benefit them. It's not to their benefit. And I don't know if your listeners, those watching us tonight, have seen that many of the African countries have recently established ties with Israel. Um, it's obviously in their benefit, and it's in Israel's benefit as well, because every vote at the United Nations in favor of Israel or abstaining on votes that are resolutions that are put up against Israel is good for Israel. And most of our African countries, and I'm very proud to say this, most of the leadership of African countries, whenever there's a, a vote coming up at United Nations, et cetera, we send an email straight away to them. We say, listen, please tell your representatives to either go out for coffee at 10 past 10 after 10, or not, or not to pitch for the day, et cetera, because they're voting against Israel. And, and it's those kind of things. And, and, and that's why in Africa today, we have very, very little, if any, I'm not talking about South Africa, I'm talking about the, our African countries, very little, uh, anti-Jewish, anti-Israel, anti-Semitic sentiment. Uh, I could go on forever, but if there's any questions, anybody wants to ask anything, say That's, anything. It's, it's actually quite amazing, Ramosha. It's nice to see that you haven't changed and you still have that uh, spunk. The Queen of England, not bad. Um, rabbi Avi Noam, <laughs> the rabbi of Childwell Shul, <laughs> our newest uh, rabbi here in Liverpool, is going to start off with a question and then we'll go around. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Reb Moshe. It's uh, the story. Actually, the stories. So many stories. Uh, so fascinating. Um, my curiosity is, how did you start doing it? It looks like something uh, that uh, you built up by yourself. So, how did you start doing this? So, interesting question. As I said, this position began uh, in 1949. 
But when I was 14 years old, I was I, I attended a school called Yeshiva College, which was the only uh, at the time Torah school in Johannesburg. And um, they used to send us out to the various small communities to to conduct the High Holy Day services. And they sent me to a town called Messina, and which is on the border of Zimbabwe in those, in those days, Southern Rhodesia and South Africa. And I just took a, a, a liking to travel to the country people, country Jews and Johannesburg and city Jews are two different, two different kinds of people. And I just, and from there, I just used to travel. And when I was in Yeshiva with Rabbi Kivan, I used to travel as well. We did a Shabbos, I think, wasn't it in Petersburg once? We did a Shabbos in Petersburg with Velvel, who's here on with us. Oh, wow. We did. Okay. It. We, we, <laughs> we did. A place and, called um, and then I was in the, in the military. I was a, a chaplain in the South African Defense Force. And there Rabbi Kivan as well traveled with me for Shon and Kippa. And then when the position, the seventh uh, position became available, I was approached and said, you know, we know that you travel, you know the country, you've traveled before, you're interested. And as I've said many, many times, every tour that I undertake is like the first tour. Um, because first of all, you never know what's waiting on the, on the, at the destination. But more importantly, the people that you visit and the people that we visit are so appreciative of just bringing a challah on a, on a Thursday. You know, they, they live 600 miles out of Johannesburg. They haven't seen a challah or a bottle of filter fish for, since my last visit. To them, that's part of their Yiddish guide. Sure, we, I mean, I send them uh, Jewish newspapers and, and uh, Divrei Torah, et cetera. And uh, they, the, most of them, those that have uh, Facebook, follow me on Facebook, et cetera. But the literal, the, the actual contact with people is so important. And, and that's what keeps, uh, keeps me going. Rabbi, do you have any contact with the um, strange Jews to call the Ab Aborid? To kind of remember, I can never remember the name of it. You know, these tribes in mid Africa. The Abu Yudaya in Uganda. Yeah. So we do have contact with them, but it's a, it's a, it's a very difficult um, situation and group to um, align ourselves with because of the policy of the government of Israel that they are not Jewish. But effectively what they want is, and they're good people, by the way, I don't think for a minute that they, they, they're genuine people, but they want ultimately to be either to be, to be allowed to make Aliyah with all the benefits, um, or they want to be able to be funded by the Israeli government in the communities they live. That's at the end of the day, that's what they're looking for. And the Israeli government made it quite clear that they will not, as, as uh, opposed to what they did with the Ethiopians, is they will not allow them all to come to Israel as a group and, and convert in Israel. They have to each individually convert where they are or come to Israel as individuals and convert to Torah Judaism. However, um, they, where we work with them is they, because they are so proud and so active Jewishly in their Jewish way, um, they experience a lot of, uh, I wouldn't call it anti-Semitism, but hostility from the local Muslim communities. And often we have to advise them and guide them what they should do, what they shouldn't do, what they should say. You know, sometimes we mustn't always wave the, the yamulka out at, in front of 50,000 Muslims, you know, and uh, or, to, or to find a way to bring the Muslims to, to sit down with you. Um, in fact, in Mozambique, Maputo, Lorenzo Marx, which is used to be called, we have such strong uh, relationship with the Muslim community that when we built, when we rebuilt the shul from 1926, the head of the Muslim community of, of Mozambique requested to be one of the guest speakers. And we weren't so sure. We thought that his people would turn on him. But we said to him, listen, you know, if you, you know, he said, no, absolutely. And the media were there, the television was there, the newspapers. He wanted to be representing the Muslim community of Mozambique at the opening of the shul. And that, as, again, that comes from a lot of work and interaction between us. That he was comfortable enough to understand that, you know, for, from himself that it's important. 
Rabbi Nathan from Allerton Shul, you had a question you wanted to ask. Yes, good evening. Thank you, Rabbi Moshe. Very, very interesting talk. Um, it's wonderful to see so many people uh, with us. Um, so Liverpool, in, in Anglo-Jewish terms, is what we call a province, a, 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 a small community, and, and in line with most small communities, has, has declined. And, and we probably have, in and around the Liverpool area, lots of uh, um, individuals, the types that you're talking about, who don't really have contact with um, Jewish communities on a regular basis. Um, could you share maybe some expertise as how you contact such people and, and where you find them and, and, and how you best engage with them? And that might be helpful for us uh, as, as a community. So I think, yeah, thank you. So from, from our experience, it's first of all, one-on-one -on -one visits. In my book, I tell a story of in a town called Boerteville, there was a Mr. Cohen who was totally anti-religious. I don't know why, but so I walked in the first time and I, and I addressed quite casually. You can see I'm not in a tie, et cetera. And neither are you, but okay, you know that. And he said, he threw me out of this, his store straight away. He says, get out. Uh, I said, what's the problem? He says, rabbis, I don't want, just get out. I want to have nothing to do with you. Anyway, my next visit, I went again and I left my card and a Jewish newspaper. And three, four visits later, he said to me eventually, he says, you know, you're actually not a rabbi. So I said, why? He says, first of all, you keep on coming back. So you're obviously not, uh, you don't take it seriously. You don't take it personally. So you're obviously not a real rabbi because otherwise you'd think, you know, if that's how you talk to rabbis, go to hell. He says, also, you're wearing denims and a t-shirt. Tea, you're not wearing a, a, a white shirt and a suit. Anyway, eventually we became very, very close friends. And, and it's basically to sit with people. That couple um, on that ladies are also important uh, to have uh, challah bake, drop challahs off, create contact, have social events. It's not all about coming to shul and having a shia. You invite everybody to the park on a Sunday. And you give divrei Torah, sure, and etc. But let just people meet other Jewish people that aren't connected either. And all of a sudden, they want to start interacting with each other. And I can tell you from our experience that those are the people that eventually become so committed, not necessarily to become from Yidin, but they become so committed to communal activities and communal life that if you, God forbid, need a minion or whatever, they say, you know what? You're short, you need one more, call me, I'll come. And, and the whole idea is to get them to come together on social events. Obviously, there's got to be kashas and, and sneers, et cetera. But it, it's got to be that they meet other people in the town. I've had umpteen cases. I'm dealing now, we've got it on Wednesday night. We're doing a Zoom candle lighting ceremony from the 119-year-old Kimberley Synagogue. And I'm talking to the, uh, the video guy, Marcel, Marcel uh, Afrikaans, heavy Afrikaans accent that we're talking. And there's just something about this guy. I don't know. I just feel, you know, and he calls a synagogue, he calls a shul, a church, etc. Turns out his father is Jewish. He had nothing to do with anything all of a sudden. But now he wants to be involved. He's excited. He wants to see. Can I help you? Can I do it? There's no magic wand, Rabbi. It's one-on-one. -on -one. If you have people in your community that are willing to go out and sit with elderly people that are lonely, people in business, people that have poor marriages, people that are suffering from poor health, that's what they want. That's what they want. Link people like that. I can tell you your community will quadruple in no time whatsoever. Give them a nice kiddish after shul. Drop them a challah and, a, and some orange juice or a wine, etc. For them, you mustn't forget, most of these people had it as kids. And then when their parents died out, they gave it up, etc. For a lot of people, all they want is, 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 is a bottle of Shabbos wine and, and a kitka and a Jewish newspaper. Slowly, they get involved. They start telling you, you haven't sent me, you haven't visited me. And so you are not going to save everybody, but I can tell you, you'll save a lot of people from being lost completely. Very good words. Um, if you have any question, you can use the, there's a button here, you can raise your hand. I see a hand is raised by two past South Africans from Sydenham Highlands North, Hebrew congregation, graduates of, of Yeshiva College like you, Stephen and Lorreen Korb, they have a question to ask. Yeah, so 
Hi, goedenavond en welkom. Goedenavond, goedenavond. <laughs> so, yeah, so, um, yes, yeah, so really, I don't have any special question, just a couple of comments and observations. So, first of all, wonderful to see you, not in the flesh, but virtually. You know, you're, you're something of a legend. I've heard so much about you, and it's absolutely, it's just wonderful to hear you talk. Uh, um, on Good Shepherd, Stan always... Um, Stan Schmuckler always alludes to you and uh, you know and just listening to to you speak and the immense experience you've had of your travels and really absolute and the wonderful work you do you know you deserve the wonderful reputation that you have so thank you for that thank but you. what I wanted to say is I heard you mention early on you went to Yeshiva College and I went to Yeshiva College also but I don't know when you were there if our paths crossed obviously a lot of time has passed since then and we may not we may have known each other but I suspect not but I went to yeah, the 80, 85 I finished in 85. Okay so I was a, a, a I'm a little bit you're a Yulka still I, I, I finished in uh, 75 I left and 76 I went to Eden, uh, Eden College. Okay, the, excellent. So, yeah. You saw that Rabbi Tanza passed away recently. Uh, yes, I, I believe so. And, uh, you know, he giant was... Giant of a man, giant of a man. A giant, a giant, of, absolutely. You know, he, and, you know, and uh, I, I still remember, I mean, I went there to the school when it was menorah, and I started there when I was sort of um, eight years old, when it was in the house by the uh, swimming pool, and it but just been like... I only mention that because that's how it was, and and yeah. uh, our it just grew and grew and grew. And at the time, Yeshiva College, I think, represented not a fringe, but people thought if you went to Yeshiva College, you were ultra, ultra, ultra from. I was, and but now it's pretty mainstream. But But anyway, uh, I won't steal the show. I just wanted to say thank you very much. It's been enormously interesting, something? and I'm my sorry. wife won't let me get away without. Yeah. I'll just say what you said about the Jewish community in South Africa is so true. It's a remarkable, close-knit community. I don't think anywhere in the world knows anything um, like that. Absolutely. Also, Absolutely. You know, I, I appreciate what you do. You know, I've got family all over, and I think you do an amazing job. So. Thank you. So thank you. Stephen, let me just say that one of the, one of the many hundreds of fantastic traits of Rabbi Tenza was that he never judged people. Never, never. And in my class, all the way from, I was there from primary school all the way through to the end, yeah, there was right. a guy there who, who ate treif, never kept Yom Kippur, never kept Shabbos, he went right through Yeshiva College. He was there because he lived two streets away from the school. Right. He, was, he was a prefect. Yeah. He was never judged because he didn't keep Torah and mitzvahs. No, that was Rabbi Tanza. Yeah. And that was Tanza, absolutely. Oh, and I can see you're carrying on that, that ethos. So thank you again. Thank you, Stephen. Rabbi Shah, share with us the story of the Matseva with Kosher Le Pesach on it. Okay, 1939, Walter Geller passed away in a town called Swakopmund in Southwest Africa, Namibia. And his wife was not Jewish. And she knew that she had to bury him in the Jewish cemetery. There was a Jewish cemetery at the time. And so they buried him, and then it came to making, erecting a tombstone. And there was nobody around for her to ask. There were Jews in the town, but I don't know why, for some reason, she didn't ask. And so she had, she found in the cupboard, a old bottle of kosher wine from Pesach. And the Hebrew words on the bottle were kosher le Pesach. So she took these two Hebrew words, and she gave it to the stonemason. <laughs> and she... And he put it on the tombstone backwards and upside down. Until late 1970s, it was a, a huge tourist attraction for Jewish people. And people used to go there and laugh, etc. And one of my predecessors, Rabbi Dushinsky, felt that the guy before the guy wasn't resting in peace. It was a, and he had it removed, but he had a very clear photograph taken before he had it removed. And the grave is still there today. I mean, and, and in fact, Walter, because of the publicity. Walter Geller's grandchildren have contacted us recently, and they didn't know part of that story. And they're, they're not Jewish, obviously, but they are very uh, grateful for what uh, Rabbi uh, Dushinsky did, but also that his grave is well looked after. 
So there's a grave with kosher the pesach on it. Fantastic. That's it. Can I come in with a, just a question? I know you, you work across Africa. Are there any um, areas of Jewish growth across Africa in terms of communities? I mean, other so than Ke uh, Kenya, Africa? Kenya has approximately 800 Jews in Nairobi alone. And that is a very, very strong growing economy. But um, so, so that's they there. And then in Zambia, Lusaka as well, there's over 150 Israelis that have moved in there with various companies and individuals running a business. Those are, Mauritius, uh, we know, is a growing community. Uh, that is a tax haven. And a lot of people go there and they send. They send us an email and they say, only if I die, somebody's going to call you and let me let you know. Till then, don't bother me. I don't want anybody to know that I'm hiding here. Uh, there's a Chabad house there. Thank God he's doing very well. He gets 120, 130 people. Um, but there are a lot of Yidin there. But again, it's it's purely, uh, that's for tax, tax reasons. But you need to accept the fact, and I'm sorry people don't like to hear it, but diaspora world Jewry uh, of active Jews is diminishing quite quickly. On the other hand, there are hundreds of thousands of unaffiliated Jews, completely unaffiliated, that are just waiting to be accessed, to be accessed, not the correct English, sorry, to be approached or to be, you know, to just to tap, I always say to dust off of a little bit of the, of the dust and, then they, and they become involved. Because today, everybody, what is the success? And I say this with the greatest respect to, to the Rabonim online here. Uh, the big shuls in South Africa today are, are, are dwindling rapidly. In the olden days, Stephen, you'll remember that the big shul had a chazan and a, and a rabbi, and, a, and everybody sat there and listened, and, and then the rabbi and the chazan. It's finished. Today, people want personal interaction with the spiritual leader. When you come to shul, they want the rabbi to say, good morning, you haven't been here for three days, are you okay? Or I see, uh, I heard your wife is not well, God forbid, or whatever. People, and, and people want, and, and that, that continues with God as well. People want to sit and not just sit and listen to a service and go home. They want to actually daven. If it's in English or whatever, and in, I mean, in Mozambique, we've just printed a Portuguese siddur, a Hebrew, English, Portuguese siddur for the community there. Yeah. Um, May I just so, say, uh, we are very lucky in Liverpool but we have great Rabbonin that do ask every day to see how their community are. Thank God. And I'd also like to say that, have you ever been to a little, uh, it's a little shtetl called Germiston? It's very well, sure. Yeah, well, my Mechutten came from Germiston. Was it a steel town? Yeah, yeah, sure. That's right. They came from Germiston, Shapiro. Okay, very nice. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Just to let you know. That's yeah, the South yeah. African. Germiston had 450 Jewish families. Today, there's not one. Really? Nothing there. So you need to accept the fact. But it's not a negative thing. It's a reality. The minute there's uncertainty or instability, mm -hmm. Jews move. It's a fact. Anyhow, they were lucky that the son ended up being a Lubavitcher and he's in Dallas and his name is Perot Shapiro. Well, there you go. You see, he went overseas. So it's worked. Yeah, absolutely. Very good. Yes, Mr. Lawrence, Mike Lawrence. Good evening. Hi. First of all, thank you, Rabbi, for a very, very interesting insight to the early, uh, early South Africa and the Jews. Um, I have a slight connection with South Africa. Um, I'll tell you a story of just how it started. Many, many years ago, um, two brothers lived in Poland. The name was Mashovsky. Um, one brother went to Johannesburg. The other brother went to Israel. We're talking about the 1940s, I think, here. Um, that the was brother Nathan's father. Nathan Mashovsky's fa father. Nathan's father. Yes, exactly. You know the, sure. Most people know the family. Nathan is my Mechutten. Was. Oh, wow. was he, he died a few weeks ago. He, yes, he did, sadly, about three weeks back. But um, what, what fascinated me with the family was the fact that 
the brother that went, he opened a small hardware shop in Johannesburg and made a living. Whereas Nathan, with his son who was born in Poland, the eldest of the four brothers, and then he had three more children in Israel, couldn't make a living in the 40s. And they went and joined, he went and joined his brother and took his wife and children over. And uh, they all went into the business. And the four brothers, including Nathan, turned the business round from a little shop into a multi-million pound worldwide business. Absolutely. Which you're probably aware of. Yes, sir. Um, they eventually, the four brothers, the parents died, they were buried in South Africa. And the four brothers, two went to Australia. Australia, that's right. And Nathan and Ruben ended up in Renana. Because they, they'd made the money and that's where they wanted to live. And they built a shul in Renana, called the Mashovsky Shul. I don't know whether you've ever been or not. I presented two tours to it in 1989 from Petersburg, from 1999 from Petersburg. We donated yeah. to Sufet Torah. To a, mag a magnificent shul. Yeah. And so much so, they bought the, the parents had died many, many years before. They brought, them, they brought to them back to Israel and had them yeah. reinterred in Israel. Yeah. Um, and that's my connection. My, my son married Nathan's daughter. Um, okay. And they live Which in Which daughter, the beautician? Sorry? Which daughter, the beautician? Yes, Jackie is my daughter in law. Send her my regards. I will do. I, I, sorry? She, the Russian Silver Half knows she, everybody. <laughs> when my son got married in Israel, she came to do all, our, all the makeup for everybody. That's what she does, yes. She's a makeup Send artist. Her Please, she's yeah, great. She, she is. But sadly, we lost Nathan about three weeks ago. Yeah. yeah. He'd been Maybe. quite ill, but Ruben's still alive. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, Ruben's Ruben. daughter married Barry Cohen. That's right, the Cohen, one of the Cohen brothers. And Barry Cohen and I were in school together, right through school. I know them all. And Barry's father was the principal. I've met him before he died. So you want to hear a funny story, Rabbi, you'll like this. Some of the ladies won't like it, but I'll tell it anyway. So I get onto the... When I was in school, I wasn't the biggest angel. And Mondays and Thursdays, we used to go to the principal. And he used to give us canes in those days. They used to give us six of the best. And then I get up at the Ranana Shul, and the contents of the shul, by the way, came from Paro, from another South African shul. So it was a combined. Anyway, I get up, and I, on the pulpit, it was Yom Yerushalayim, Chief Rabbi of Israel was there. It was a big event. And I look in the shul, and half the shul are people from Yeshiva College Shul that were at my bar mitzvah. And I totally froze. I thought, like, you know, yeah. anyway, and there I saw Mr. Cohen, who was the principal. I don't know if you remember, he was six foot two. He was a big, big man. And I, so I needed to break the ice and just for myself, never mind for the audience. And I said to him, Mr. Cohen, do you remember me? And he like looks and looks. So I turned around on the pulpit and I lift, bent over and I lifted my jacket. And I said, maybe now you'll remember me. <laughs> and everybody burst out laughing. He said, ah. Zolbehaft, he says, I remember you. <laughs> Jillian, you're next. Thank you very much, Rabbi Moshe. It was really interesting to listen to. My question involves um, the breaking down of apartheid and the um, involvement that the Jews had, which was enormous, such as Joffrey, who is so well known in Britain. Um, he's been on very, he's been heard all over Britain. Um, I think he's passed away now um, a while back. But also, um, I think the first person who hired Nelson Mandela was Jewish. There was a whole crowd of them. I know they weren't necessarily religious. There's actually quite a large group of them. My question, though, is how on earth did the South African jury manage to um, sort of not infuriate the ruling body at the time, even though they were the Jewish people there have been fundamental in overthrowing apartheid, how did how did the South African jury manage to do it without resulting in immense anti-Semitism, which so, is what I would have expected? Yeah, no, no, valid question, valid question. So first of all, remember that the National Party government were very religious Afrikaans people. So they 
respected the Jewish people as the chosen nation. For those of you that know Peter Dirk Ace, who knows Peter Dirk Ace? Come on, Stephen. Yeah, it's uh, Stephen is what? Peter Dirk Ace is an Afrikaans guy living in a town called Darling. And he's, he's gay and he's Afrikaans and he dresses up as a lady and he trashes the government and everybody loves him. His mother dies and they discover that she was a survivor of the Holocaust and he's Jewish, in fact. So now he considers himself a son of both chosen nations, the Afrikaans community and the Jewish community. So there was always the connection between the Afrikaans community and the Jewish community. Second of all, the leadership at the time, and the second thing is don't forget that Israel did a lot of business with the apartheid government here, which by the way, the ANC government today throw in our face every, every time we talk to them. They say, oh, but you were in bed with a... And third of all, the... Uh, what was I going to say? Third of all, the community at the time felt that while they officially didn't um, stand up against the government of the day, behind the scenes, they were very, very active. Many, many Jews were extremely active. And something keeps on coming to my mind, it slips out, but it's something very important is going to come to me now. And so there were, so, oh, in 1985 or 86, Mervyn Smith, who was the chairman of the Board of Deputies at the time from Cape Town, he was my boss as well. He got up and he apologized, which when Mandela was released, 1989, I think, or 91 or something like that. He said, I apologize on behalf of the Board of Deputies for the last 40 years, 50 years, whatever, is for not publicly speaking up and against the apartheid government. What you do need to do, understand where you're coming from, but you need to understand that when it comes to governments and protecting Jewish communities, the leadership of the time often have to do things that don't suit them just to protect the community that's in the country. And I can tell you that if the Jewish Board of Deputies and members or, and many more Jewish members of the community became more proactive, anti-apartheid, et cetera, our community would never have survived and, and thrived the way they did. And, and you, you know yourself, you can see that, that every Jew, 99% of Jews that lived here, even though there was a apartheid government, they were very good to their staff, very good to the, the children of the staff. I mean, I officiated at the 100th anniversary of the Nairobi Hebrew Congregation Synagogue in Kenya. And the Minister of Foreign Affairs got up to speak and he said, I want to thank you all because of you Jews. I'm in this powerful position that I am today. And I thought, wait, this, you know, I had an idea where he was going with it, but I thought and the media was there, the TV was there. So I went over to him on the podium and I said to him, please, Mr. Minister, explain more what you're saying. He said, no, it's very easy. He says, my mother was a domestic at a, at a Jewish home and the employees sent me to a, to a school, a private school. They then sent me to a, a, the international university. I was able to get better educated than the average. And hence I'm in this position because I'm better educated, et cetera. So I said, okay, now people understand a little bit better. Um, there's no real answer why. I mean, I can't answer for what Jews did, why the Jewish leadership didn't stand up against uh, apartheid. But the minute they were able to, they did speak up against it. The flip side of it, and listen carefully, Gillian, the flip side of it is that the DA and the PFP, which Tony Leon and Helen Sussman, uh, you know those names? They reckon, you reckon, yeah. Yeah. So they were... So, so Tony Leon was speaking once in government and Tabo and Becky, who was the president at the time, uh, and they were like chirping each other, like interfering with each other. And eventually Tony Leon uh, uh, and Becky turned to Leon and he said to him, okay, I hear you, it's very nice. He says, but where are all your people that were busy fighting and shouting? He says, you know where they are? They've run away from you. We came into power 
And now they've run away. They're in Perth, and he says, they're in Australia, they're all over the world. He says, where are they? And that's something that, that as conscientious Jews, it's very important that we remember that it's easy when you hear and important when you're local to speak up and be active. But when the reality sets in, who are the first to run away from here? Without, I'm sorry, it's, re, you know, it's partly a reality. But that's really interesting because I heard Joffrey speak on the radio for a very long period of time and every name he talked about pretty much apart from one or two and he went through lists of people. They were all Jewish behind getting Nelson Mandela out. And I just wondered, were the, were the government not turning around and saying, you Jews, what are you doing? You're creating Never. problems. Never. Never. That's really interesting. We're going to take a short break now. We have a raffle um, of some interesting items. And Rabbi Fegelman has all the, is going to share the screen. We're going to do a raffle. And then we're going to finish off with some wonderful pictures. And Rabbi Moshe, you'll tell us about our trip to Rutfontein after the raffle. That's it. Nathan, Robert Fegelman, unmute yourself. Yes, hello everyone. So thank you for joining us. Um, just to spice things up tonight, we thought we'd do a raffle, although in hindsight we didn't need to because people have been so fascinated with your, with your interesting stories and developments. But nevertheless, it's always some fun to give out some Hanukkah gifts. So the first prize you can see here is a bottle of Ochen Toshen with uh, single malt whiskey. So the way it works is we click to spin and it's going to land on a name and they will be the winner. I've tried to leave out people who I know don't live here, but um, obviously I don't know everyone. If you live in uh, reasonably close or Manchester, we can obviously get it to you. Uh, if you live uh, abroad, um, you might have to spin Good again. So the first spin is... Okay. First spin is... Ooh, uh, David Mann, how did the gods know? How did the gods know to get a good whiskey too? So that's for you, David. We'll be coming your way. Um, the next prize is moving down to a bottle of Jeunesse uh, semi-sweet uh, kosher wine. Uh, we're going to spin again. And the winner is Barbara Rosenberg. Now, are you my friend Barbara who lives in London? Um, if you are, just let, 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 let make yourself known. I'm not even sure which Barbara Rosenberg it was. Uh, I can leave it with your mechotonim, um, the, uh, the deacons for you. So if you just confirm or if you wait, you send, send me a message Thank in the chat and we'll take care. Oh, here you go. Hello, Barbara. Hello, Natan. Thank you very much. I live in Maidenhead. Yeah, you're Maidenhead, yes. yes. Barbara's a friend of mine. She's a uh, one of the organizers of our contorial convention, uh, concerts and conventions. Um, you're in Maidenhead. So I'm going to leave that with Cheese Machutan, though, Thank with you. Uh, Harold and um, Harold Deacon. Yeah. So we'll leave it there for you. And the next time you see them, you can pick it up. And finally, tonight, we have a box of Bendix mints. You can't beat good Bendix mints. And we will click on it once again. And the winner. Is Ooh, it's Jack and Rosalie. Now, I didn't know which Jack and Rosalie we're dealing with. Are you local, Jack and Rosalie? Oh, we're in Australia. Are. We're in Australia. We're in Australia. Australia. Okay, <laughs> I think we're gonna have to do it again in that case. I'm afraid. Thank you. Uh, And this time it is Gillian, a reward for your a reward for your probing questions on a difficult political subject. So um, we will uh, get that to you. So uh, we'll go at, uh, and thank you, Reverend Keeman, and we'll go back to the to the questions. Okay, I'm. Um, I want to share with you a picture. Or a few, just a few pictures, and then Ramesha, you'll expound on it. And if that's the end of tonight, we had a great night. In 1988, for Rosh Hashanah of 5749, Ramesha was in the, in, there was ma mandatory army then. 
you had to go in the draft. So a nice Jewish boy like a Moshe again with a gun and going to start shooting. There was a war in Angola. So he was the chaplain. And this is us two days before Rosh Hashanah, somewhere in Angola. Remember, he took me out there. We could hear bombs and there were holes in the ground where soldiers slept at night. And we went there to tell them that there's been an instruction from the chief chaplain in Pretoria that they, uh, they can come to the army base called Khrutvantein, otherwise known as Khrutis. And everyone had to wear a uniform there. I was the only one dressed in civilian clothing. They thought I must be really somebody important. I had such derecherets there. This is in a rattle. That's me. A rattle, that's right. This was in the kitchen with two of the kosher soldiers kitchen, there. Absolutely. Preparing for Yom Tiv. That's our two chefs. And this is Mutsa Yim Kippur. Do you remember these guys? Sure, these are sure. four Israeli cameramen who were in the wilds in the bush of Africa. They came for Yom Kippur. They turned up to Kol Nidre, and they turned up again to Neila in a rush. We should finish on time. We didn't have internet in those days. We didn't have any of that. We had to look, wait outside to look for three stars so we know that Yom Kippur was over. And they were in a rush, and we took a picture with them afterwards. Right. This, Ramesha, was your goodbye party when you went off Sukkos, to the army. Sukkos. Sukkos. Was it what, your birth? No, this wasn't Sukkos, no. No, this was a, a party when you were going off to the draft. And here's Bill on the line with us Delvin. tonight. That's it. That's me. We made a, in our dormitory, we had a party for you. You were off That's right. to the army. That's it. That's it. And here's us. That's it. The younger one of us, the, the, the young one, when we were younger, 33 years ago, 1988-89. Yeah. Tell us about your time in the in the chaplaincy. Um, well, basically, as you said, Rabbi, it uh, was mandatory at the time for South African males to go to the South African army. And uh, every religion had... Uh, chaplains and uh, there was myself and one other guy that was a Jewish chaplain for two years and for six months I was in as you said Grootfontein on the southwest Africa border now Namibia uh, which Angola at the time and, and uh, southwest Africa were at war and it was from Rosh Hashanah till Purim the following year and that's when Rabbi Kivan came for Rosh Hashanah and Kippur to the help of the davening and the laning, etc., and we gave him a couple of tours in the Rattel, and he experienced Africa a little bit. Um, great experience for me. Great experience. Um, it's when you really these guys, you know, Jewish kids. The last thing they want to do is end up in the bush somewhere or having to wake up four o'clock in the morning and have to run for thirty kilometers in boots and a, and a rifle. Uh, but the government, uh, the army used to break them down and, and uh, we were there for them. And I used to do Shabbatot for them, etc. And in fact, the one guy in the one picture that uh, with our, with our, uh, standing outside the rattle comes to Shabbos at Shul. Still, I'm, I'm still friendly with him after all these years. Oh, wow. And um, yeah, so that was six months on the border. And then the rest of the time I traveled South Africa, we were two chaplains at the time uh, doing the whole country. Um, yeah, as, as I said earlier to Jillian, the Afrikaans generals or the leadership or the head, I don't know what the, the correct military terminology is, of the military were very, very respectful for, for the Jews, for their observance. And, and even if the Jewish boys weren't Shomrei Shabbat or even from anything, Shabbos, they didn't have to do anything. We used to run a Shabbos project for them, or if we were really lucky, we could bring them home and they could see their parents, etc. Uh, there was very, very great respect. Um, and obviously, most of the Jewish kids never landed up in the, in the front line because each one of them arrived with a file, not a letter to say what's wrong with them, but with a file of, <laughs> of all the excuses what was wrong with them so they shouldn't land up uh, with a rifle in, in the front line. Um, we did lose a number of, of uh, lieutenants that were Jewish that were killed during wars. But on a whole, the Jewish guys managed to... Uh, not get sent on the front line. Well, if there aren't any other questions, I just want to say, first of all, your book is available on Amazon UK on the Kindle for £4.79, but the hard copy 
it must be a very best seller because it's on sale for 82 pounds. Wow. In England. Sure. Okay. <laughs> Um, no Moshe, thank you very, very much on behalf of everybody here. I think we had a very enjoyable evening. Your commitment and your dedication to the Jewish community in Southern Africa, not just the country of South Africa, but in all those countries is amazing. Your faith in people is encouraging. And uh, we really, I can talk for myself and others here, we really, really enjoyed it. On behalf of Childwall and Allerton Shul and Lubavitch Liverpool, we thank you very much, and we wish you chazak v'amotz. I didn't realize your father recently passed away. I remembered him very, very well. So we wish you nechumim and his good, his good deeds. He was a very generous man about Zdaka and, 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 and a special man. May that serve as a comfort for you, thank you. And your family. And we should only know from Simchas. We should all have a freilich and Hanukkah, a happy Hanukkah. And when we light our candles, we'll be thinking tomorrow night, we'll be thinking of you in Johannesburg and all the little shtetalach that you have, that you're the ambassador for them. And uh, please, I God. I'd like to say before you go off, just to let all your listeners know that we have two very active Facebook pages and uh, anybody is welcome to follow or join. The one is my name, Rabbi Moshe, Rav Moshe Silbaf, the traveling rabbi. And the other one is Small Jewish Communities Association. Uh, we're very active. We uh, forever posting, and it's it's very well received. And uh, that's by by uh, subscribing to that, people are able to follow our activities. For example, people uh, you know saw tonight's event, and and as I travel, I uh, I post pictures so people can actually sort of travel with me and get a feel of what's happening out there. Thank you, Rabbi, and bless you and your family for the incredible work that you do. And the inspiration, and uh, thank you for your friendship. It means a lot. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Have a good. Afrela and Chanike from New York City. Melville. Afrela and Chanike from New York City. Oh man, Sadira Echid. Good to see you all, Melville. Let's see what New York City face looks like. You know, <laughs> it's amazing. Getting ready for a snowstorm. Oh, okay. Enjoy, enjoy everybody. Africa. Be take well, care. take care. Bye. Bye. Thank, thank you for you. your time, Ramosha. It's coming up to thank midnight you, for you, so time to go shloven. Thank, thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. All the best. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Tomorrow night, Bye. At the same time, we have Dudu Fisher concert. And we're wow. going to have greetings from the Chief Rabbi, as well as the Lord Mayor of Liverpool will be here as well. So that's tomorrow night at 7 30. Um, and we look forward to meeting you all again. Have a Freilich and Hanuk, everybody. Don't forget to give Hanukkah Gel to your children and grandchildren. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Rabbi. Nice to see you all. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Very nice.